Hello and welcome to Titanic Project 401, named after Titanic's hull number. We are going to take a tour of the ship, starting in the crow's nest, going through the windlass room, the crew quarters, the boiler room, the engine room, the third class suites, the first class Molly Brown's room, Turkish bus, gymnasium, first class promenade, bridge, second class dining and eventually ending up on a poop deck. So why don't you join me for a tour of the Titanic? Here we are in the crow's nest looking aft at the bulk of the ship. We can see the bridge and we can see the forward funnel. This is where on the night of the 14th of April at 11.40 p.m. Lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg immediately ahead of Titanic and alerted the bridge. There are a number of ways you can alert the bridge. You can just yell at them because, well, they're not that far away. You can use the bell attached to the forward mast, which would get their attention, certainly if you rang it like hell. And you have a portable Graham Navy type telephone with a little key to unlock the box. So you'd have been able to have a conversation with the bridge from up here. The bridge and everything forward of it would have been in complete darkness because the ships didn't have radar. That wouldn't come about until the Second World War. You also didn't have searchlights because the way you saw at night was to stand in darkness and allow your eyes to get accustomed to gain night vision. So, on the night of the 14th of April, the sea was like glass, there was no moon and there were stars in the night sky. It was very difficult to spot where the sky ended and the sea began. The horizon was just not something that was visible. The way you normally spot icebergs at night is that either they are illuminated by the moon or you can see waves crashing over them. You can see the white water from the waves breaking against them. But with the sea so flat, there wasn't any of that going on. So the way they saw the iceberg ahead of them was an absence of stars. Kind of a spooky, spooky thing to see. So... Seeing a black mass heading towards them, they alerted the bridge where First Officer William Murdoch ordered the ship to be steered around the iceberg and the engines to be reversed. Well, the triple expansion steam engines would have been reversed, but not the turbine. That would have been shut down. It was too late, however. The ship was struck on the starboard side, creating damage to the hull below the waterline. The plates weren't torn so much as buckled, breaking the rivets, holding them together. You may ask, why did the ship not just ram the iceberg? Well, that's because a lot of the crew, the people who are actually working on the ship, would have been billeted or stationed in the bow of the ship. So you have to make a decision. Do we ram the iceberg and kill a bunch of people for certain? Or would we try and go around it and hopefully save the ship? And that's the decision they made. So, let's go down and see what's below. The ladder at the bottom of the crow's nest deposits you in the very bow of the ship. So, as we leave here and move forward, there are a few interesting things that we can see. We can see a well down into the forward cargo hold. We can also see the windlass and winding room ahead of us. And this is kind of, well, there are some features here. So, we have the winding gear. There are chains on the deck above us, and those lead to the port and starboard anchors. You're not lifting those by hand, so you have an electric system to lift them. You also have, in the very bow of the ship, a hole. Now, if you've seen pictures of ocean liners, you might say, what is the hole in the very bow of the ship, and why is it connected to this big drum of cable? That is to a third, or emergency anchor. So... In the very peak of the bow, an emergency anchor was attached, and if they were anchored up and bad weather was coming in, they could deploy that to have a little more chain on the bottom to hold themselves stable. The sister ship to Titanic, so she had a couple of sister ships. She had Olympic, because this is the Olympic class ship. She also had Britannic. Now, during the First World War, Britannic was turned into a hospital ship. The Admiralty partly paid for these style of ships and the understanding that if war were to break out they would be used as auxiliary cruisers. So Olympic and Britannic were turned into a troop transport and a hospital ship respectively. Off the coast of Gibraltar 
during her first tour, Britannic deployed her anchors, including the emergency anchor, in bad weather because the storm that came in was threatening to push her onto the coast and destroy her. The three anchors held, and she survived. In fact, she survived her first tour of duty. She was given back to her owners, who started turning her back into a passenger ship. Then the Admiralty came calling a second time and said, could you stop that and can you turn her into a hospital ship once more? So she was sent back into the Mediterranean where she met her fate at the hands of a submarine laid naval mine, blew a hole in the bow and she went down. In fact, the reason she went down was not because the watertight doors were compromised, but because the nurses on board had left the portholes open against orders. And as she went down, water started coming in through the portholes and sealed her fate. Anyway, we are now in Titanic's kitchen for the crew. And there are some interesting features here. And this cucumber, for example, is not a zucchini or a courgette. And that appears to be a cucumber with a, with a bit of bread there. So it looks like they would have made bread in the kitchens, which is one of the ways to have fresh bread. But also cucumber sandwiches are a very, very British thing. We also have an electric rumbler. So we have electric cable come into a motor with a chain drive, which is the fact that it's not covered seems a little bit dangerous. So you put your potatoes in here. There are some abrasive wheels and they spin around and it basically makes a rumbling noise and the potatoes are devoid of their skin. They're, the skin is removed by the abrasive wheel. Let's have a little bin next to it, which I believe and I will be corrected if I'm wrong, empties out onto the ocean. So you just dump your kitchen waste into the sea. Ahead of us, we have, well, a copper, a copper kettle. So a big copper pan. Now this is very reminiscent of what I would have found in my grandmother's kitchen for boiling preserves. These things would have been polished with an inch of their life. You'd have been continually polishing these things because otherwise they'd have oxidized and gone a little green. You have an Arga or Rayburn style stove where you put coal. There is one functioning fireplace on the Titanic. However, if you want heat directly into your cookware, well, you're going to need to put coal in this, which is why it's got a flue above it. The way to control the heat is to have these concentric rings on the top. So you have little rings that you put over the big old hole and that limits the amount of heat directly interfacing with the bottom of the cookware. There is also a lip around the outside, a very high lip, because ocean liners were expected to maintain travel through all weathers in order to maintain a service, which means the ship might be a rockin' and a rollin' and to stop things falling off, well, you have a big old lip around things. You also have a lip around the tables themselves, similarly to stop things sliding around and off. And a Belfast style sink. And I'm wondering, having used a Belfast style sink, how many of the cookware and crockery were actually destroyed in this thing? Because you put them in and then everything kind of bounces around ceramic against ceramic. So yeah, very interesting. As you move forward out of the kitchen, we can go, well, we can go left and then left again into the mess. So who would have been using this? Who was stationed at the very bow of the ship? Well, that would have been the trimmers and it would have been the firemen, the people stoking the fires. So what we can do is we can leave here and we can go back on ourselves down another flight of steps. So we go down and we go down again. What we should be able to do is move our way to a point where we can, uh, not here, but here. So we scoot forward. We have in the very bow of the ship a lot of these bunks. So the firemen would have been here. There is a tunnel in the very bottom of the ship that leads from the boilers to the spiral staircases and they come up. The reason you wanted to keep your firemen away from the passengers is because these guys worked in very, very difficult environments. It would have been very hot down in the boiler room, they would have been covered in coal dust and grime, and you just didn't want your first class passengers seeing how the ship was actually run. So these guys would have been kept separate from everybody else. You also have here, whoop, down into the chain room. So the chains would have been stored here, right in the bow. 
and you would have had a lot of chains. So this goes up through another little hole up into the windlass and winding room. So if we leave here, what we can do is we can head back, back to the spiral staircases. And if we carry on down, we should be able to find ourselves in the fireman's tunnel. So down and then down again, just keep going down. So these guys would have been working something like a four hour shift because of the temperature in the bottom of the ship itself. And it is, well, it's a heck of a, heck of a way to get down. Hope you're not feeling dizzy. Okay, so this is the fireman's tunnel. Way out this side, way in this side. Men will break step while in tunnel. So we can scoot forward along this hole here and then into the number six boiler room. The fireman's corridor opens out into boiler room number six, but if we 180 degrees and back up a little, we have one of the watertight bulkheads and one of the watertight doors held in place using a clutch and electric motor mechanism. We have a cog on the back of it, which lowers the door under power. So if the ship is in trouble or just needs to close the watertight doors for a test, what you do is you push a button and all of them descend under power until the last few inches when they drop like a guillotine. If you try and Indiana Jones your way through a closing door, you're likely to die of misadventure as this thing slams down on your body. So as we turn once again and face the boiler room, we have a number of coal-fired boilers. Now, it would have been very, very warm in here, around 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 49 degrees Celsius. Fireman works on a four hour shift with an eight hour off. So four hours on, eight hours off, and you would have gone through the tunnel to the bow where you would have eaten and slept. The boilers themselves ran at around 215 pounds per square inch and were tested up to a pressure of 430 psi, so they had a little bit of headroom. You would have taken these wheelbarrows, filled them up with coal, and then shoveled away. This was a job that was ultimately replaced when diesel came in, so you would have had oil bunkers and then an automatic system to feed the boilers. However, up until the First World War, certainly, the German high seas fleet actually had trouble with their boilers during the Battle of Jutland, where they lost some horsepower because the boiler tubes were coked up and they needed to stop and clean them out. But in the middle of a battle, well, that's not something you can reliably do. The coal bunkers are here. So you have a door and the front of the coal bunker is not especially watertight. It's not designed to hold back water. It's designed to hold in coal. So as Titanic left port on her maiden voyage, one of her coal bunkers was in fact on fire because if you get coal wet, it can spontaneously combust. And that's apparently what happened. It didn't contribute to a sinking despite the conspiracy theories and was something that was just a common fact of having coal aboard ships. The reason the outside of the ship is painted black is because the way you coal up a ship is there are doors in the side. So you open the doors and then you use a crane and a load of lads with shovels. You shovel coal into the buckets and then pour them into the bunkers. It is a very messy business, so everything gets covered in coal dust. In order to mask that, you just paint the sides of your ships black. Uh, we have a ladder that goes all the way up and we have the end of the boiler room itself. So what we'll do is we'll head forward into the engine rooms. In the engine room, Titanic had two triple expansion steam engines. So steam from the boilers would have come in here at around 215 PSI or 394 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have gone into the first of four cylinders. So first of four cylinders at 215 PSI, it would have exited and gone into the second cylinder at 78 PSI or 322 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have then gone into the two outer cylinders at around 24 PSI or 255 degrees Fahrenheit, exiting at 9 PSI or 188 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, it would have entered the Parsons reaction turbine at 9 psi which is less 
than atmospheric pressure, effectively a vacuum if it were in the outside world. It works because the condensers operate at 1 psi or 102 degrees Fahrenheit. So they knew what they were doing when they built these engines. The triple expansion steam engines can be put into reverse, although the Parsons steam turbine was not able to go into reverse. It would have required complex gearing and linkages for that to happen. The drive shaft itself would have been connected underneath. So you had three drive shafts, three propellers on Titanic, two being operated by the triple expansion steam engines and one being operated by the Parsons reaction turbine. You would have had to grease and oil everything in here. Everything would have been in motion and you would have had to keep everything well lubricated. Health and safety was not really a concern in the Edwardian era. And you may say, well, the Edwardian era actually went from 1901 to 1910. This is 1912. Yes, most people just go from 1901 to the beginning of the First World War for the Edwardian era. Now we can actually see the steam turbine if we go up here and take a right through here out into the third class hallway. Go left and then left again. So we are now underneath funnel number four. Funnel number four, not a fully functioning funnel, although there are some gases that vent through the top. There are some photographs of Titanic with little heads appearing above funnel number four, as some of the crew were just peering out over the edge, taking a little bit of a smoke break. Uh, and if we look down oh, below us, we have the white casing of the Parsons turbine. From the top of the steam turbine room, we can exit into the corridor. A little ahead of us is the engine room to the right, but to the left is the engineer's mess, a little more opulent than the fireman's mess. Although one thing missing from the tables is the lip around the outside. Now I don't know if that's just the developers of the game not putting them on, or whether they didn't have them. I would say they are absent in the game, but probably there in real life. Behind us is a picture of King George V. Born 3rd June 1865, died 20th of January 1936, and arguably ruled over the British Empire at its zenith. So what we'll do is we'll move out of here. King George V being the name also of a steam engine that was gifted by the United States of America, a bell which was put on the front end of it, and my great-grandfather was either a fireman or an engine driver aboard the King George V steam engine. This is the Scotland Road corridor, so if we speed up a little bit, we'll take a little turn off here, down these steps, into third class dining. Third class dining, which doesn't seem too bad. We have these, instead of benches, we have these very heavy looking wooden chairs, probably needed on something that cuts through the ocean waves. And we have some menus here, so we can use a mouse wheel to scroll up and zoom in. Middle mouse will zoom straight out again. So RMS Titanic, April 14th, 1912. Well, they would have got the whole menu at least. So for breakfast in third class, you would have been eating oatmeal porridge and milk, smoked herring, jacket potatoes, fresh ham and eggs, fresh bread and butter, marmalade, Swedish bread, tea and coffee. Honestly, that doesn't sound so bad considering not long before this, Transatlantic travel would have been in the bottom of a sailing ship, along with everyone else throwing up into their own eyes. Dinner. Rice soup, fresh bread, cabin biscuits, roast beef, brown gravy, sweet corn, boiled potatoes, plum puddings, sweet sauce and fruit. For tea, you'd have had cold meat, cheese, pickles, fresh bread and butter, stewed figs and rice, and tea. Lots of cups of tea here. And for supper, gruel, cabin biscuits and cheese. Now I'm not entirely sure gruel should be on the menu, but here we are. So if we zoom back out, yep, lots of fresh fruit, lots of little hooks for your coats and possibly hats, because in this period of time, gentlemen certainly, and a lot of ladies would have been wearing hats. In fact, during the First World War, which only came a year after Titanic sank, if you were to find yourself in a prison camp and wanted to escape, your disguise would have had to have had a hat. 
for if you escaped without a hat, you'd have stuck out in public. Most people wore them. So as we leave here, we'll go back up the stairs and we will head back down the corridor. This is a very long corridor and it gives you an idea of how big the ship actually is. Not as big as today's cruise liners, but definitely, definitely big. So we have the steward's lavatory, steward's lavatory. We have some sinks, we have some urinals. So if you don't know how you use these because you don't, well, you haven't seen them or haven't used them before, you stand here and then the other person doesn't stand next to you because there's only two. So only one person can use these two uh, and then you never make eye contact with anyone. Anyone else coming in here wanting to use a urinal has to go in the sink. So that's just one of the one of the etiquettes that you have. Also, we have toilets with louvre doors, interesting, and wooden seats. Not entirely sure about the hygiene of a wooden seat, but again, here we are. As we look back on ourselves, I think we may have passed the steward's cabins. So steward's cabins, beds very similar to the fireman's. Everyone's in here just kind of very close together, uh, possibly metal sprung beds with a mattress on top, an unsprung mattress on top. It may have been quite noisy depending on how many people snored, but then you can deal with other people snoring quite simply by holding a pillow over their face. I wouldn't try that in real life, don't, don't do that. As we move forward, we can find one of the third class cabins. So there should be 19A around here. As we head in here, third class cabin. And it doesn't seem to be that bad. I would suggest there are some things missing here. Maybe they would have had curtains over each of the bunks so you could just draw them for a little bit of extra privacy. Otherwise, yeah, it's not the worst sleeping accommodation I've ever seen. A little bit more upmarket than the stewards with the wooden sides to the beds. Uh, you'd have had a deep side normally so that if the ship is rocking and rolling around then you didn't rock and roll out of bed. So from here we can head up into the third class open space. So third class open space we have some wells above us which have the wood that can be moved away so you can drop things via crane down into the cargo holds. We have portholes. So probably, uh, well, portholes with covers, but you would have also had glass covers on top of those as well. I don't know if you could have opened those to have fresh air come in. I don't know if you would have wanted to with the wells above us. Uh, we also have a drinking fountain placed here. And interestingly, we have these white units which take air in from above, the Scirocco fans, so centrifugal fans. And the way you, you operate these is they spin very fast using a centrifugal fan blade and draw air into the lower areas of the ship. So you don't want the ship getting too hot, too stuffy and too full of carbon dioxide. Speaking of the British Empire at its zenith, there was a time when the sun didn't set on the British Empire. No matter how you feel about it, it is something that happened and it is part of history. There is something here that is quite interesting. There are routes that go down to South America, notably Rio de Janeiro and Brazil. There is another vessel that would have sailed between Germany and South America, and that was the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg, being a Zeppelin-class airship, would have gone from Germany over French airspace, much against the uh, French's wishes, and the French didn't, qu didn't quite like the Germans at the time. But the Hindenburg did do an entire season between Germany and South America. It didn't explode on its maiden voyage to America, and while it did explode at Lakehurst, it had, in fact, traveled several thousand miles before that happened. So from here, I think what we'll do is we may as well progress to the first class entrance. So let's jump to there. 
As a first class passenger, this would have been the first room you saw aboard Titanic. A bare metal room painted white. To one side you would have had the doorways which would have opened up and gangplanks would have been attached. So you'd have walked up the gangplanks to the white painted room, gone through the double doors and met the grand staircase at its midpoint. On B deck you would have seen the cherubs holding electric lights. In fact, Titanic had all electric lights. There were no gas lamps here. Now at home you may have had gas lights with a gas mantle, very fragile mantle in them to create light against the dark. But here everything was electric, including the fireplaces. So if you needed to be warm, you would have just had one of these. Interestingly, if we go into the stateroom B51, which is here, into the drawing room, we do have what looks like a fireplace, but it is all electric with a carriage clock on the top. Now, cabins B51, 53 and 55 were the most expensive and one of the most luxurious parlor suites of the Titanic. Located on the starboard side of B deck, they were occupied by Charlotte Cadenza and her son Thomas Cadenza. The sitting room B51 had green chairs, several sofas and armchairs and a fireplace. In the demo, they are definitely blue. We have here in the bedroom some beds and a sink. Now, it looks like the beds are very small and I had to do some research into this. During the First World War, which was one year after the Titanic sank, the average height of a British soldier was five foot six and the average weight was eight stone. The upper end of that was five foot seven but five foot seven would have made you quite tall and you can see how tall soldiers were when you come to things like the Mark V tank. There's not that much room on the inside to move around. So you'd have had a bedroom, you'd have had your drawing room and they would have had a private promenade with this wicker furniture. The wicker furniture is very reminiscent to early aircraft. Early aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, would have used wicker furniture on board because it is very strong and very lightweight. Interestingly, you have all of this panelling, all this very detailed panelling, but just behind it, you have the shell of the ship itself and what looks like a pair of maybe weeping figs. So these people would have paid a lot of money to be here, but like all of the other cabins, even though they have locks on the doors, if you wanted to lock your door, you had to communicate with the steward and have them lock it for you. Nobody were given keys. No pass keys, no card keys, no little locking keys. You'd have had to get someone to lock it for you and then unlock it when you wanted it unlocked. This is one of the first class cabins. This is the whole first class cabin. So you'd have come in here, you'd have had your sink, your fireplace, and you'd have had your beds. The doors are open between the cabins, but this is one, two, and three first class cabins, separate first class cabins. The reason the cabins had their own fireplaces is because not everyone was from dear old England. Not everyone was used to the British weather. Some people traveling aboard, notably the Americans, would have wanted a little bit more heat, especially if you were place from places like Texas. So you could crank up the heat locally in your uh, in your cabin. Also absent are toilets. If you needed to use the toilet, well, you had to go and use a shared shared facilities. We also have elevators behind the grand staircase, electric elevators. So you get in, and it's likely that there would have been somebody operating them for you at that period of time. There would have been somebody riding up and down the elevators just making the thing work for you. If we go down a level, we will find an office space. So we find reception. Now this is where you come to do your correspondence. So you can write letters and have them sent using the wireless. So there's a vacuum tube behind, a pneumatic tube. You can also deposit your valuables. So we have a safe here. Now, if you're a first class passenger and you're traveling with money or jewels, you would really want them to be in the safe. The stewards locking the doors are fine, but the stewards are earning way less money than you are. And it's quite a temptation to pick up any loose items. You also have another safe here for staff pay and some dollar dollar inside. 
And here we have letters and pigeonholes. So the holes themselves, they would be called pigeonholes. Uh, a deck plan. And what does this say? Reminder. Find owner of cufflink found in reception. So a cork board which you can pin notes on. If you need to send a message, you can send a message through here. It'll be written down. You will pay a few cents per word. I think something like 50 cents per word. And they will go up through the vacuum lines up to the Marconi wireless operators. The wireless operators were not paid by the White Star line. They were operated and paid for by Marconi. So you had the wireless set and then the operators themselves were sequestered to you. So that's kind of interesting. If we go down another level, we find ourselves in the first class reception area. And we have a big square room on the middle, which is one of the funnel uptakes. So a very insulated wall, very decorated wall, but there is definitely a funnel uptake on the inside of that. So very, very hot gases moving up there. We also have some portholes. So if we go to the side here, we can see one of these windows being open. So we have stained glass windows in front of the portholes themselves. At night, these would have been illuminated from behind using these electric strip bulb. So no expense spared. You'd have had natural light during the day and then in the evening you would have had electric lights through the what would be the portholes. We squeeze through there. No, we cannot. We go through the reception area into the dining area. Now, interesting. Uh, can we see what's written on the menus? Let's do a little zoom in. So, uh, luncheon consommé, fermière, coquelique, uh, filet de brill. There's a lot of French on here. Uh, corned beef, vegetables and dumplings. This is for lunch. From the grill, grilled mutton chops. Uh, fried and baked jacket potatoes, custard pudding, apple meringue, pastry. From the buffet, salmon mayonnaise, potted shrimps, Norwegian anchovies, soured herrings, uh, plain smoked sardines, roast beef, round of spiced beef, veal and ham pie, Virginia and Cumberland ham, bologna sausage, uh, what have we got? Corned ox tongue, lettuce, beetroot and tomatoes, and various cheeses. Uh, Cheshire, Stilton, Gorgonzola, Edam, Camembert, Roquefort, and uh, got the old cheddar there as well. I don't know how accurate the menu is in the game, but there is a definite difference between third class and first class. Although I'm going to say, honestly, it doesn't seem like there's too much difference. It seems all very robust and hearty food, and we can't get to the kitchens in here because they are if they are modeled they're just not accessible so that's one thing what we can do is turn around and head back up to the grand staircase on the grand staircase it is worth noting that these offices here are the inquirer's office and the purser's office i don't think i named them before so what we'll do is we'll start here and we'll go down so we'll go back through the first class reception area with a very interesting, just catching my eye, a very interesting print on the little sofa there. But this time we will carry on going down. So as we go down another level, what we'll find is another clock revealing exactly the time of day that it is currently in the real world. Yep, those clocks are definitely, definitely matched to the system clock. We're in fact going to go this way to cabin E23, so up here, E23. So this is either a first class or second class cabin, depending on how they, or what they needed at the time. This was occupied by Margaret Brown. So she was born 1867, died in 1932, and escaped on lifeboat number six. But quite interestingly, on the night of the sinking, she reported that the crew were using cranks on bits like this, little little nubbins in the floor. 
And what they were doing is they were lowering the watertight doors manually from below. So the watertight doors that weren't electrically operated or had clutches on them, they needed to be hand operated. So what you did is you put a crank in the floor and then gave it a, gave it a few turns there. So what we'll do is we'll carry on going down. So the grand staircase ends here, but you can carry on going down a little bit more. So behind it and down. And what we should be able to do is find a way to the Turkish baths. So through here. At the bottom of the grand staircase, we find ourselves in the Turkish bars. The bars would have been open between 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. for women and between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. for men. There was a charge of four shillings or 25 pounds by 2023 standards or one dollar and 31 dollars by 2023 standards. There are some notable features, including the chaise lounge, but also we have porthole covers, even though the room, the cooling room, which is what we find ourselves in, is inboard of the outer hull of the ship. I think the idea was that the decorations were made with the idea of this room being against the outer hull, but by the time the room was actually positioned, the decorations were made. So what they did is they put mirrors behind these things. At the back of the room, we have some little changing cubicles with velvet curtains. And at the back of the room, we have ourselves a weighing chair. The Edwardians were very big into health. We imagine the people of the olden days not really caring about how badly they smelled or in fact health, but the Edwardians were fully into exercise and cleanliness. We also have a thermometer, the clock, and a little water fountain. So this would have opened into this area here where we have things like the electric bath. I haven't found much or any information on this thing online. In fact, people talking about it don't seem to know how it works either, other than this is what was there. As far as I can tell, it's a steam bath. You pop yourself inside, it gets hot and steam is formed, very much like a sauna. It appears to be similar to the one that's in the film Thunderball with James Bond, where James Bond seals Count Lippe into a personal steam bath, cranks the cranks the heat up and then throws a broom handle across the doors, sealing him inside. It doesn't kill the lad. He appears later on in the film, but it does appear to be somewhat uncomfortable. It does, in fact. That particular one seems to be quite comfortable to be in. So as long as James Bond's not around, you should be fine. In here we find the blade douche, so we have a table that you lie on. What is not modelled are the corrugations that would be beneath you to allow the water to drain away. You have the blades which can be angled to face various body parts. You have the bulbs and you have the shower heads. You also have a needle and shower bath. So you stand up and you stand inside this thing, inside the ring. Turn on the water to its desired pressure and temperature. You are showered from above and then I believe there are little needle holes on the inside which shower you from the sides. It is essentially a wet room with a drain. So it is apparently quite invigorating. Although not everyone who experienced it liked it that much. As we move back towards the swimming pool, we find one of the watertight doors. And this is where they would have been manually cranked from the floor above. So these doors were not electrically operated. The crew had to put in cranks and actually hand crank them. We also have a fire hose here. So if there was a fire anywhere near here, they could hose it down. Hopefully they turn the electric off towards the bath first. Otherwise, anyone in the electric bath would be, well, it'd be a shocking experience. This appears to be, well, it is the swimming pool, but it may be modeled off of RMS Olympic swimming pool. I've seen photographs from Olympic and they are very similar. So whether they just had the same room and there was no difference between Titanic and Olympic, I'm not sure. But you may note that the water level is quite far down and that is because on a ship, especially an ocean liner, this thing would have been a rocking and a rolling around. So the water needed to be able to slop sideways. You probably wouldn't have been able to use it in a high sea. Water 
very famously reaches its own level. So if you do take a picture of the ocean, if you want to have that thing leveled correctly, always level the horizon where the water is, and that will give you a nice level picture. Never level it with the land. Another couple of showers and some changing rooms. So if you wanted to go swimming, you got a change room with a little wicker seat inside. Excellent. What we can do is head back out and up and then head up the staircase to the top floor. At the top of the central staircase or grand staircase, we have another cherub holding a little light. We also have the dome above the staircase itself. And it is very interesting because if you want to see sections of an Olympic class staircase, you can go to the White Swan Hotel in Alnwick, located in the UK within Northumberland. The hotel's Olympic suite incorporates panelling mirrors, a ceiling and stained glass windows which were removed from Olympic when she was being dismantled in Jarrow in 1936. It also features sections of the staircase itself as part of the hotel's main staircase. So there are sections of an Olympic class ship that still exist. It is also 4 minutes to 5 because I've been recording for a very long time, but but, but, but this area at the top of the staircase is light open and airy and it is absolutely beautiful. If we go back towards this door here, we can enter the first class gymnasium, which was exercised under the eye of the ship's physical educator, Thomas Macaulay. One survivor de described Macaulay as a ruddy-cheeked spry little man, clearly devoted to his job. So it says here that the gym was open to women from 9am to noon and men could only use it from 2pm to 6pm. But if we look at the door, the times are slightly different. 10 till 1, 2 till 7 and children from 1 till 3 only. Interesting that there is an overlap between the gentlemen and the children. But you have, you have some machines that are very familiar to us. Exercise bikes which this clock will go round, so red and white are here uh, controlled by the separate bikes and little pulley system so you can race against your friends. Although I have heard that one of these bikes would have been for men and one for women. I'm not entirely sure because that kind of goes against the, the race system that they have. We have a punch bag, a little speed bag. We have the rowing machine. In fact, we have two rowing machines. We have some devices which are a little strange. An electric motor and a couple of wheels which sort of you stand here with your back against the wooden plate and it vibrates you. You also have an electric, now is this the electric camel or the electric horse? I believe those two are the electric camels and we have, yeah, this is the electric horse. The idea is you get on and it mimics the movement of a camel or horse and it's very good for your liver. I have seen one of these, a modern version. It is not very good for your liver. It is very good for other parts, other parts that I may not have. Um, not entirely sure what everything else is and we are currently getting stuck on the, on the rowing machines, but very familiar if you've ever been in gym. We also have the vertical weight. So you grab those and give it a pull and that should exercise your arms. The Edwardians were very, very big into health. So what we can do from here is probably head out onto the first class promenade, another piano. So music is very, very big on the Titanic and we can head out here. Yeah, first class promenade. Up on the first class promenade, we see, well, we see a few features. There are in fact two promenades for the first class. There is this one, which is open to the weather and one beneath us, which is closed in from the weather somewhat. We have four funnels. So we have one, two, three, and four. One of which is not smoking like the others. So it doesn't have uptakes from the boiler room. The last funnel is because, well, most ships, most people were expecting four stackers as being the most opulent of the ocean liners. So it was worth putting four funnels on your ship. It did have a few flues in there for things like the first class fireplace, but you would also see in some photographs, little heads poking out of the top of the fourth funnel as people were taking smoke break or just looking around from the top. 
Interestingly, we have a bunch of deck chairs. Now you could rent a deck chair for a small fee and you would be given a cardboard ticket, which would say your chair location is, and there'll be spaces for the deck, the side of the ship and the chair number. So you'd have to rent yourself a deck chair if you wanted to be out lounging in the sun itself. Over here we have some more of the Scirocco fans, some more of the electric fans, because you want air to be drawn in from the outside to ventilate the inside of the ship. It was very important for things like carbon dioxide, but also things like temperature. You just wanted to regulate the temperature on the inside of the ship. In the middle you also have the compass platform, and it says notice passengers are not allowed on the compass platform. Here you have a binnacle, not rendered, is the compass itself, but you have a couple of metal balls either side to adjust the compass's performance. The binnacle meaning, well, it derives from Latin meaning habitaculum or little dwelling place. On a ship with a magnetic compass made of metal, you needed these things, these little houses for them to be in. Otherwise, if they were just out in the open, they just wouldn't function very well. As we cross to the other side, the light side of the ship, as the sun is over here, we'll head back a little way and what we'll see is the engineer's promenade. Passengers are not allowed beyond this point, so the first class promenade is separated by the engineer's promenade and then beyond that is the second class promenade. So in society, first, second and third classes were separated. If you got yourself onto a steam train, steam locomotive, you would find that is the same thing, so you would have first, second and third class carriages. You also have the lifeboats, which are on davits and have cranks in order to lower them down onto the water. On the night of the sinking, people were kind of reticent to get into the lifeboats, thinking that the ship was not in mortal danger. The idea behind the lifeboats and the reason it wasn't enough for every single person on board was that you didn't really want to be in an open top wooden boat in the middle of the Atlantic. Big old waves were very very dangerous and there was a good chance that this would get flipped and you would be dumped out into the water. In the North Sea off the coast of Britain your survival time for being in the North Sea is about six minutes before hypothermia sets in and you just die of being too cold. That is actually what happened on the night of the sinking. People going into the sea would have died of hypothermia and I can speak from experience. Having recovered from hypothermia, it is the single most painful experience of my life. It's not so much getting cold that's the problem. You get cold, you get numb, you start to shiver and then you stop shivering. It's a very strange experience. But once you warm up, it is like being in a blast furnace and the pain from your limbs is unbelievable. I have been laid down on my side trying not to cry. It is just, just unpleasant. The idea with the lifeboats is that because you have watertight compartments, you have also the cables above. The four cables above us connect to the Marconi wireless sets. You would radio for assistance and because there are a lot of other ships in the area, the North Atlantic routes would have been essentially highways for other ships. You radio that you are in danger and then you can use the lifeboats to transfer passengers from one ship to another. So that's how they should have worked. What actually happened is the ship went down faster than the Carpathia could reach her. And so only the only passengers in the lifeboats, around 700 of them, were picked up by the Carpathia. They did have flares on board. So there was a green flare. So the Carpathia, seeing a green flare on the water, thought that she was seeing Titanic's navigation lights when in fact the Titanic had gone down before Carpathia could get there and what she was actually seeing was one of the flares from one of the lifeboats. So what we'll do is we will head forward and notice passengers are not allowed forward of this because in front of us is in fact the bridge. So we can go through to the officer's promenade 
Moving on from the first class promenade, we are on the officer's promenade, moving past one of, I presume, one of the collapsible boats. I believe in the Night of the Sinking, one of the collapsible boats literally floated off of the deck, so people jumped on board and were like, oh, that's handy. As we move forward a little more, we have the bridge itself, a wooden structure. Uh, must be noted because on the actual wreck, the bridge is completely destroyed. In fact, after the event, it was said that parts of the bridge structure were found floating on the surface. Interestingly, we also have the wings and wing cabs, navigation lights and little glass windows, which apparently can slide up and down. You would stand here if you were monitoring the ship being laid up against the quayside. So it itself would not have bow thrusters like a modern ship in order to be moved into port. You would say take on a pilot and have tugs maneuver you against the quayside. Ropes would be laid down and you would be pulled in. But if you were coming through a channel you would definitely need to see down the sides of the boat. You have ahead of you the bow with a little wall to push water away either side of the uh, bar itself and one of the well decks with covers over the wells down into the cargo holds. You also have the chains for the anchors, port and starboard. What you don't have, or what I don't know about, are these little bird tables. Couldn't find anything about them online, so if you know how are they or what they are, uh, let me know. Otherwise we'll say they put seed on there and just allow little birds to come along and back away. You have one of the steering positions with another compass in another binnacle. You have covers for the windows. You also have the telegraphs for indicating the engine rooms exactly how fast you want to go. You have port and you have starboard, interestingly. This one's not labelled, so I don't know which one of these would have been port and starboard engines and then which one of which one would have been in the turbine. You also have let go tug, not clear starboard, slack away starboard. So you have indicators here telling everyone on the outside what to do. So here you would have had a few people on the bridge. You'd have had Commander Edward John Smith at the age of 62, who was the captain of the ship. You'd have the chief officer, Lieutenant Henry Tingle, uh, Lieutenant Henry Tingle Wild, age 39. You'd have had Lieutenant William McMaster Murdoch, age 39, and you'd have had Sub-Lieutenant Charles Herbert Lightoller, age 38. Lightoller, in fact, survived the sinking of the Titanic and went on to command the HMS Falcon in the First World War. And he was, well, he was not to be messed with, put it that way. He was quite uh, an active captain. So you also have another steering position with blinds around the inside. At night, this is where the ship would have been steered. You stand here and you steer with all of these blinds down. So everyone else is outside and they are maintaining their night vision, being able to look around with binoculars at night to be able to see what's going on outside the ship. Remember that there's no radar. But you would be in here with the doors closed and the blinds down, actually steering the ship based on communications with the people outside. So as we move back outside the ship, we can in fact see another interesting location. So we'll just scoot forward and then in here and then all the way back to a room at the back of the section here, which is the Marconi wireless room and these tubes, these vacuum tubes come up from the office below. They'll have messages written on them by the crew and the passengers. So you would use the telegraph machines to, uh, to send messages out to the outside world in Morse code. And I have a little telegraph here. So uh, what we'll do is crouch down and zoom in on these guys. These guys here, the little knob on the top is where you put your hand or you put your fingers. There is a brass arm and at the back, they have actually modeled this quite, quite closely. There are three little thumb screws which you attach your cables to. And there are two thumb screws in the back. The one at the back closes the gap at the front of this device because they have to make an electrical contact every time you push down. And the one in the middle, or just slightly further forward, is actually the spring pressure. 
thumb screw. I have one right here. I don't know if you can hear that as I just tap away on it. The gap at the front is very, very narrow. And basically what happens is it makes an electrical, electrical connection every time you push down and it goes beep. Essentially, there are dots and dashes in Morse code. So what you do is you send out dots and dashes to the outside world. And when you are fluent in Morse code, it's very, very, very rapid. You have your headset on, which honestly looks very uncomfortable for a long period of time. You also have a stopwatch here as well, a little pocket watch. And these guys would have been the computer nerds of their day. So they would have been in here. They were Marconi operatives, the Marconi workers. You have here the Marconi house uh, calendar. And yeah, these would have been the computer nerds of their day, very interested in technology and the advancement of. Also interesting, uh, all of the electrical connections that are just open to the elements, oh, they're just live connections. Some of the cables do have uh, shrouding on them. Those would have probably been silk. If I know, if I know what's in um, Cornish houses, we moved into a house in Cornwall when we were children. My family bought this house and there were a lot of silk wrapped electrical cables in there that the electricians went, hmm, probably want to get rid of those before your place burns down. Uh, also here are the, if we move into here, the Marconi wireless operators quarters. So you have two operators, a little bench and some places for your clothes. Otherwise, at the top of the ship, lots of natural light, lots of natural air, a little light bulb, and a couple of clocks, different times of day. All those, these are actually showing 10 to 6, which is, is in real life. Excellent. So let's piece out of here. Oh, what's in there? I don't know if we can get in. Oh, we can get in here. Oh, more electrical connections and a generator. Interesting. Very interesting. We're in second class dining, and the difference between first, second, and third class is significant, but second class were not by any imagination poor. So a third class ticket would have cost around £7 in 1912, which, as I record, would be about £800 in today's money. A second class ticket would have cost around £13 or £1,500 in today's money. And a first class ticket would have started started at £30, or more than £3,300 in today's money. Now, looking around, it is similar to the third class dining saloon, but much more airy, much more light. But what we don't have in amongst the silverware are any menus. So I found a menu from April 14th, 1912, which lists dinner as consommé, Tapioca, baked haddock, sharp sauce, curried chicken and rice, spring lamb with mint sauce, roast turkey, cranberry sauce, garden peas, pureed, tur pureed turnips, boiled rice, boiled and roast potatoes, plum pudding, wine jelly, coconut sandwich, American ice cream, nuts assorted, fresh fruit, cheese, biscuits and coffee. So yeah, you were, you were eating fine in second class. As we go out, we have another set of stairs. So we have the stairs up. We also have an elevator, which is very interesting. So you have first class elevators, plural, and you have an elevator for the second class. We also have uh, drawing rooms. I believe we also have smoking rooms above, so we can go and find those. Now if we find ourselves another set of stairs and the base of the rear mast, another piano. So as we go up, yep, time is in fact 10 past six. Excellent. So as we head out here, what we can do is head into one of the smoking rooms. And you can tell it's a smoking room because not only do you have boxes of red tipped matches, so I believe the matches did not require a striker to light them, just something that was rough, very much like the cowboy films. But you also had little ashtrays here. Smoking was a big part of life. In fact, if you went into a cinema 
right up until ooh, maybe the 90s, you would have seen the beam from the projector being illuminated by all of the smoke in the atmosphere. Smoking indoors was a huge thing. In fact, women wouldn't be smoking socially until the 30s, not until around 1929. But in 37, 1937, stars like Joan Crawford were paid thousands of dollars to smoke Lucky Strike on screen. And the reason for that is the tobacco industry saw that it was missing out on 50% of its profits by not, not advertising smoking to women. So up here would have been likely a lot of gentlemen. So as we go out, we can see the rear well deck. And we can see some of the cranes, which would have been used to lower cargo through the hatches in the well deck. And we also see the, see the stern as well. So what we can do is head down across the well deck into the stern aft well deck. Coming from the second class promenade to the rear well deck, we see the back of one of these cranes and the crane itself has a number of levers. So the operator would have stood here and been able to maneuver the crane, move the jib up and down, move the whole thing left and right. And it's very important that you do that because the sides of the ship, the gunnels could be moved inwards, so laid flat. Cargo could be brought in here and then these grates would have been lifted up and moved away so that the cargo could be dropped down the wells into the ship itself, into the cargo holds. It's interesting that the load cannot exceed two and a half tons, so your mum can't be lifted by one of these cranes. At the very stern of the ship, we have two extra rooms here and some more benches. We have the third class general room, which is, I mean, I've seen worse places to be. It seems quite lovely. There is a lack of paneling on the ceiling but the outsides have been paneled and we have lots of natural light coming in through the portholes. On the opposite side we have the third class smoking room so a room that would likely have been filled with gentlemen just uh, just enjoying a smoke I guess. So we also have as we go back outside the poop deck and another one of the Scirocco fans. So we have intakes above us and the Scirocco fans themselves blowing air down into the ships. So above there's another light, another couple of cranes and then air intakes. Above us is the docking bridge. And things to note above here, we have bollards for anchoring the ship while in port. So you wrap your ropes around here and then they will be attached to the quayside. But these black squares here are not for the benefit of the passengers, for the benefit of people on the water near the ship. They warn of prop wash. In fact, they say where the propellers are on the outside of the ship. So if you're in a small craft, a light craft, you do not get sucked into the propellers when this thing is moving. You also have the blue ensign, which is on the back of the ship. And you'll have a sign here saying, notice passengers are not allowed on the docking bridge. You'd have seen the style of bridge if you've ever seen HMS Warrior. So you have another couple of telegraphs, you have a telephone, and you have a wheel and another compass. As we look forward, we see the bulk of the ship. So we see the second class, uh, second class rooms and promenades. And what we can do is have a peek over the side of the ship. So when you are docking, the bridge can't see everything that's going on. So you put people back here so they can have a better view of the key side as you are being maneuvered, uh, maneuvered against the key and then moored up. Excellent. I think we've covered most of the ship now. So what I'm going to do is leave it here. Uh, if you like these videos, definitely leave a little like. Leave a subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. If you want notifications when videos go live, dingle the bingle. If you don't want notifications, don't click the bell and I'll tell you what. I'll catch you next time. <laughs>